Hello again. Um, today's lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, a detailed analysis of Santiago's journey into the sea. And in this particular lecture, I'm going to cover five important areas about his sailing. The man of war bird and dolphin, and how Santiago is uh, looking at these two types of animals. Then Santiago's uh, talk with himself. Uh, then the moment when the marlin eats the sardines and how Santiago after that resolves to, to fight the marlin. In the end I'm going to talk about uh, how Santiago now can see the, the, the size of the big marlin and how the narrator presents the physical description of that huge fish. So we start with the first point, the man of war bird and dolphin. Uh, the sun rose thinly from the sea and the old man could see the other boats uh, low on the water and well in towards the shore, spread out across the current. Then the sun was brighter and the glare came on the water and then as it rose clear, the flat sea sent it back at his eyes, so that it hurt sharply, and he rode without looking at it. He thought that the early sun always hurt his eyes. Just then the old man saw a man of war bird, with his long black wings, circling in the sky, ahead of him. Now he rode slowly and steadily towards where the bird was circling, because its presence According to Santiago, what he sees indicated the presence of, of a flying fish in the sea at that spot. The next moment, some flying fish spurted out of the water and sailed desperately over the surface. The bird tried to chase the flying fish, uh, and at the same time, now Santiago noticed a big school of dolphins cutting through the water below. The bird had no chance, in fact. Flying fish were too big for the bird, and they weren't too fast. The old man thought that the big fish must be somewhere near that spot. Now, Santiago is, uh, is watching the flying fish burst out again and again, and the ineffectual movements of the bird the bird was almost out of sight now, and nothing showed on the surface of the water but some patches of yellow, uh, sun bleached, sargasso, weed, and the purple, um, formalized um, bl bladder of a Portuguese man of war floating close beside the boat. It turned on its side and then righted itself. The old man cried, Aquamala! Just then he noticed the bird circling again. Perhaps it had spotted, spotted some fish. As the man washed, a small tuna rose in the air and again dropped into the water. Then another tuna likewise rose and fell into the water. Anyway, one of these fish got hooked by one of Santiago's lines. He pulled it aboard and felt extremely happy. The catch was an albaca. Uh, about 10 pounds in weight, uh, the, the old man thought that this fish would make a beautiful bait. Now, Santiago is, is talking uh, to himself next uh, this event. Then the old man began to, to talk to himself, and he didn't remember when he had first started talking aloud when he was by himself. He had sung when he was by himself in the old days, and he had sung at night, sometimes when he was alone, steering on his watch in the, in the smacks or in the turtle boats. The old man thought that he had started talking aloud when alone, when the boy had left him. But he didn't remember. Uh, when he and the boy fished together, uh, they usually spoke only when it was necessary. It was considered a virtue not to talk unnecessarily at sea, and the old man 
had always considered her so and and respected that 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 practice of being silent while fishing. But now he talked aloud because he thought there was no one that they could annoy. But now he thought that the that he should think of of only one thing, and that was fishing. Uh, for this he was born. After that, we find that the marlin starts to eat the sardines. As the sun was very hot now, and the old man felt himself perspiring on his neck, sweating, as he rode. It was the 85th day, and he thought of, of catching a big fish. Just then, watching his, his lines, uh, he saw one of the projecting green sticks dip sharply. He reached out of the, of the line and held it softly between the thumb and forefinger of his right hand. He felt no strain, no weight, and he held the line softly. He could feel the pull. Not solid, not heavy, or he could uh, know that 100 fathoms down a marlin was eating the sardines that covered the point and the shank of the hook where, where the, the, the long uh, forged hook projecting from the head of the small tuna. The month was September, and so the marlin must be huge. He, he thought about that. A few moments later, Santiago felt that the marlin had moved away from the sardines. He wondered if the marlin had gone away altogether. Uh, then came the, the same delicate pulling touch again and again. Santiago felt happy at this particular stage. Now, Santiago felt a hard pull. It was unbelievably heavy. It was the weight of the fish and he let the line slip down. This is part of experience. Down and down, and rolling of the first of the two reserve coils. As it went down, slipping lightly through the old man's fingers, he still could feel the great weight. Though the pressure of his thumb and finger was almost imperceptible, Santiago had a 340 fathom coils of line in reserve besides the, uh, the the coil he was using. He was earnestly wishing that the marlin should eat the sardines to the point of the hook going into its heart and killing it. But that didn't happen. The fish just moved away slowly and the boat also began to move. This clearly indicated that the boat was being dragged by the fish. The fish dragged the boat towards the north, and the northwest, in fact. The fish now moved steadily, and they traveled slowly on the calm water. Uh, the other baits were still in the water, but there was nothing to be done. At this time, Santiago wished the boy to be with him. He said aloud, I am being towed by a fish, and I am the towing bit. I could make the line fast. But then he could break it. I must hold him all I can and give him line when he must have it. Thank God he's traveling and not going down. The old man was um, uh, troubled to think what would happen if the fish went down. But he was confident of doing something for there were plenty of things he could do. Four hours later, the fish, still swimming steadily, out to sea, uh, uh, towing the, the skiff. And the old man now was still braced solely uh, with a line across the, his back. He was surprised to think that since noon he had never seen the fish. His straw had seemed to cut his forehead. He was thirsty, uh, too, and uh, he got down on his knees, and being careful not to jerk on the line, uh, as it has moved as far into the bow as he would get and reach the water bottle with one hand. So he opened it and drank a little, then he rested against the bow. 
He rested sitting on the uh, unstepped mast and sail and tried not to think, but only to endure, to have power of focus. There were two hours be now more before the sun set, and he thought that the fish would come up before that, and might be it would come up with the moon. He still had no cramps and felt strong. He felt as if he had the hook uh, in his mouth. The old man only wished that he could see the fish only once to know what had against him. The fish now didn't change its course nor its direction all the night. He could do nothing to the fish, just as the fish could do nothing to Santiago. It was cold after that, and after the sun went down, and the old man's sweat dried cold on his back, and his arms and his old legs uh, he tied uh, the sack uh, around his neck so that it hung down over his back and he cautiously walked down until the line that was across his shoulders now. His mind then uh, turned to baseball. He wondered how the baseball came out in the ground leagues that day. He wished to have a radio and then he wished the boy to be with him to help him or to see all this, he felt that no one should be alone in the old age. Then he thought of eating the tuna in order to keep himself very strong. During the night, two purpose came round the boat. The old man could hear them rolling and blowing. He could tell the difference between the blowing noise that the male made and the sighing blow of the female. The old man thought that they made jokes and loved each other. They were brothers like the flying fish. The old man began to feel pity for the great fish that he had hooked. The fish was wonderful and strange and who knew how old he was. He had never come across such a strong fish. It was a great fish and it would bring him good money in the market if the flesh was good. He wondered if the fish had any plans or he was just as desperate as the old man was. He remembered the time when he had hooked a male marlin. The male fish always let female fish feed first and he, the, 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 the hooked fish, the female, made a wild panic uh, stricken uh, despairing fight that soon exhausted her and all the time the male had stayed with her crossing the line and circling with her on the surface the male fish had stayed so close that the old man was afraid he would cut the line with his tail which was sharp as as a scythe and almost of that size and shape at that time the male fish jumped high into the air to see where the female fish was. On that occasion, the boy was with him, and now the old man wished the boy to be with him to see this experience. Santiago thought that the marlin's choice had been to stay in the, the, deep, dark, wo the deep dark water and far out beyond all snares and traps and the treacheries. And the old man's choice was to go there to find him beyond all people in the world. And uh, uh, now they, they were together since noon and no one was there to help either of the two. He thought that he shouldn't have been a fisherman, but was the thing he was born for. Then suddenly he thought of eating the tuna uh, after it got light. In the darkness... He loosened his sheath knife, taking all the strain of the fish on his left shoulder. He leaned back and cut the line against the wood of the gunwale. Then he cut the other line closest to him and in the dark made the loose ends uh, of the reserve uh, coils fast. Now he had six reserve coils of the line. Uh, there were two 
from each bait and he had served and the two from the bait the fish had taken and they were all connected he said aloud i wish i had the boy and then he thought he was alone and the boy was not there he turned his attention to the last line in order to cut it away and hook up the two remaining reserve coils uh, he had uh, looked to everything that could cause him trouble. He said aloud, Fish, I'll stay with you until I am dead. Santiago had decided to take the things to their end. And when the sun had risen further, he realized that the fish was not tiring. There was only one favorable sign. The slant of the line showed that the fish was swimming at a lesser depth. The old man thought that he had enough line to handle the fish. Now that it was daylight, he thought that the fish should jump so that he would fill the sacks along his backbone and uh, with air, and then he, he would not go deep to die. Santiago uh, again addressed the fish, saying, Fish, I love you and respect you very much, but I will kill you dead before this day ends. The old man at least hoped so. Now, we move to, to, to the most important thing in this lecture, which is uh, the bird, the wobbler, and his hand when it cramped. A small bird, wobbler, bird came toward the skiffer from the north and the bird which was flying very low on water was very tired it settled down on the line the old man talked to him as if it understands what uh, santiago was was talking uh, now santiago asked the bird to stay there as long as uh, it liked it just then the fish gave a sudden lurch the old man would have fallen on the boat if he hadn't balanced himself in time. The bird soon flew away. The old man thought that he must remain alert all the time. Once more, he wished that the boy were with him. Some of the flesh of his hand had been cut, and when the fish had pulled the line with a jerk, so he dipped his hand into the sea, and just because of the salty water. Then he cut the tuna in small pieces and began to eat it raw. He wished he had some salt to relish the raw tuna, and he chewed the tuna slowly but effectively so that he could get all the juices. He wished he could feed the marlin also because he had begun to consider him as a brother. Now he was feeling the cram in his left hand he prayed to God to take away the cram in order uh, that he, he might be able to deal with the marlin uh, he rubbed the cramped hand against his trousers and tried to, to gentle the fingers but it wouldn't open he didn't want to open it by force it might open with the sun it might open when the tuna was digested he looked across the sea and realized how lonely he was. The clouds were building up now for the trade winds, and he looked ahead and saw a flight of wild ducks etching themselves against the sky over the water and the blurring, then etching again. Very beautiful image the narrator is, is picturing out to us. And... Uh, we find that he knew that no man was over alone on the sea, just himself. The old man thought, and he hated the crumb. It was a treachery of one's own body. It was humiliating before others to have a diarrhea from uh, to main uh, poisoning or to vomit from it. But a crumb humiliated oneself, especially when when one was alone. So, again he thought of the boy. If he were here, he would drop the cramped hand uh, for him and loosen it down from the forearm. But he thought his hand would loosen gradually. 
Now, the last part of the lecture is devoted to uh, the, uh, the appearance of, of, of the big fish. The old man noticed the line slanting slowly upwards and the surface of the ocean obliged the head of, uh, of the boat and the fish appeared on the surface of the sea. It looked bright in the sun. The marlin rose its full neck from, uh, from uh, the, the water and then re-entered it smoothly like a diver. Now the old man had seen uh, the marlin for, for the first time. And the marlin's sword was as long as the baseball bat. Its tail was like a big scythe blade. The marlin was two feet longer than the boat. It was a huge fish indeed. If it were to become violent, it could create havoc for the old man. But it didn't realize its own strength against the old man. The old man now said, uh, but thank God. They are not as intelligent as we who kill them, although they are more noble and more able. Santiago wondered why the marlin had jumped, perhaps to show how big it was. His determination and his intelligence would prove to be more than a match for the marlin's bigness and strength. The old man settled comfortably against the wood and took his suffering as it came, uh, and the fish swam steadily and the boat moved slowly through the dark water there was a small sea rising with the wind coming up from the east and at noon the old man's left hand was uncramped the handicap of a cram was gone and the old man was happy he was not so religious but he said i will say ten our fathers and ten hail mares that I should catch this fish, and I promise to make a pilgrimage to the Virgin or the Cobra if I catch him. That is a promise. So Santiago promises divine prayer. He began to say the prayer uh, mechanically. Hail Mars was easier to say than our fathers, he thought. He prayed, blessed Virgin, pray for the death of this fish. Wonderful, though he is. Uh, he was determined to kill the marlin, no matter how big it was. He would kill it in all its greatness and glory. He would show the marlin what a man could do and what a man could endure. He uh, had told the boy that he was a strange uh, old man and uh, now he, he would approve it. The thousand times he had approved it mean... Uh, uh, nothing, but now he was proving it again. He, uh, he, and each time was was in a new time for him, and he never thought about the past when he was doing it. He wished that the marlin uh, would sleep, so so that he he took could sleep and dream about the lions. However, he thought that he should think further. He should rest gently against the wood and think of nothing. He should work as little as he could. So thank you for, for listening. And this is everything about today's lecture.